I originally was going to talk about the Mel Brooks film Blazing Saddles and whether that film could be made in today's environment, but instead I ended up watching a different Mel Brooks film and that made me change my whole topic. This is the Kazdoy Closet. I'm Kazdoy. That's my closet full of all the stuff that I love. And today, my argument that for the most part, Mel Brooks films are really not that funny. Let's check it out. Now, I don't want to sit here and trash Mel Brooks. You know, people love him. He's considered a comedy legend. He's done a lot of work in his life. And uh, so I'm going to start with some positive comments. The first film I ever saw by him is uh, The Producers from 1968. It was his first film. And I think his best film, even though it's kind of crudely made, but these two guys, Zero Mostel and Gene Wilder, I had never seen them before. I thought they were the funniest thing ever. And they worked well together. I mean, really well. And I like the concept of it. It was kind of dark, kind of edgy about them making this terrible play called Springtime for Hitler. And I never heard any kind of dark humor like that before either. So uh, I remember when I uh, uh, was describing this film to my grandmother, and this is a woman who, who's almost her entire family was killed in the Holocaust. Uh, and I told her about, yeah, they're making this play called Springtime for Hitler. That is not funny. She did not find any humor in that. There's nothing funny about Hitler. No, Grandma, you don't understand. It's supposed to be in ba bad taste. It's supposed to bomb on, on stage. I don't care. There's nothing funny about that. So there was kind of the line between the generations there. Um, I will also say that when I saw Blazing Saddles in uh, 1974, I was 17, a senior in high school, and I saw it in the theater. I have never before or since seen an audience laugh so much at a film before. They were just almost rolling in the aisles. There was so much laughter during that film. Two of his other films, Young Frankenstein and High Anxiety, although I don't think they're very funny, I do appreciate the um, cinephile attention put to those films, the look of them uh, and the, uh, the tribute to them. They're really an homage to the Universal Monster films and to uh, the Hitchcock films. So I appreciate that. I also like the fact that he can cast very funny people. Gene Wilder, Zero Mostel, Madeline Kahn, uh, Marty Feldman, uh, John Candy. So he has an eye for who's funny and who's not. And he even throws in some old-time comedians that I remember from growing up in, during my comedy nerd days, like Jan Murray and Henny Youngman, they show up, and some other one, Charlie Callis, shows up in one of them. So some of those guys show up, too. That, that, I find that kind of fun to see these guys show up in these films, usually in these cameo um, appearances. So, saying all that positive stuff, what's my problem with the Mel Brooks films? Well, here we go. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I ended up watching a different Mel Brooks film and that kind of um, inspired me to do this episode. And the film I watched was History of the World Part 1 from 1981. And it's part of this Mel Brooks collection. I'll talk about this collection a little bit later. But um, here's my problem with this film and it leaks into some of his other films too. And, you know, I'm not a... a, a, a PC type of person. I'm not looking to be offended all the time. I'm not super sensitive or, or hypersensitive and stuff or knee jerk or anything like that. But some things, you know, really stuck out in this film. Uh, for example, and I'm talking about History of the World Part 1, for example, the word fag or faggot is used three times in this film. And that's pretty offensive to a lot of people, I would think. Now, uh, I'm not gay, but if I was, I think I would find that offensive. Now, when I was teaching high school, you know, every so often, some kid in class would use that word, call his friend a fag or something like that. And I had to call them on it in front of the class and say, that is not acceptable. Because I knew there's, it's likely there's at least one gay kid in my classroom. And I didn't want him to grow up thinking, you know, that teacher never called that kid on it. I want him to see that I you know, being their role model, whether I like it or not, uh, had to call the kid on using a word that is inappropriate and offensive to a lot of people. And that word shows up pretty often in that film. Uh, another thing that shows up in here is 
Uh, Mel Brooks is playing a king in part of this film, and uh, he has usually a very uh, buxom young lady standing next to him with her breasts, you know, pretty well exposed. And every once in a while, he'll, he'll either grab her breasts or he'll put his face right in there and then look at the camera and say, it's good to be the king. All right, he does that once, kind of funny. That line is kind of memorable. Four times this happens, that's a bit much. It's also like sexual assault. So it's one of those sex jokes that probably flew back then, but I don't think it's gonna fly right now. Um, by the way, the film Blazing Saddles uses the N-word several times, uh, I think only by white folks. And yes, I know Richard Pryor, the black comedian, was one of five writers on that film, and he was supposed to play the lead, but he didn't. But still, that really sticks out nowadays, and the word faggot is used in Blazing Saddles as well. Um, now, regarding the jokes in History of the World Part 1, I'd say maybe 75% of them are just like sort of dumb sex jokes, like double entendres or, or sexual innuendos, a pretty juvenile kind of stuff you'd say in high school or middle school. They're not real witty or clever or anything. And another thing that happens in History of the World and in several of Mel Brooks' films is breaking the fourth wall. And we know what that is. That's when a character looks right at the camera and says something. And yeah, Shakespeare used that. They call them asides when a character would look at the audience and clue them in on something. But if you use it sparingly, it can be funny. Maybe you use it once. And I've seen uh, people like Jerry Lewis and Woody Allen use it, usually once in their films. But... This is done, almost every character has a moment where he's breaking the fourth wall and looking directly at the camera and talking. And so it's overdone way too much. It keeps drawing attention to the fact that you're watching a movie, ha ha ha. And there's also a musical number. Mel Brooks does a thing about the Spanish Inquisition. And it's like, the Inquisition, the Inquisition. It's not that funny. And he's, it's also him playing to the camera. And at one point during that whole sequence of this musical about the Spanish Inquisition, I'm thinking, am I watching a film or am I watching a play? What am I watching here? It's just very odd the way it's done. Um, now, another point I want to make is, and this is probably my favorite point, why is Mel Brooks appearing in his own films? Because I don't know what his comic persona is supposed to be. He's funny looking. He sounds funny, but it's not like he's playing a, uh, a nebbishy guy or he's not like he's, he's, uh, he's, he's not self-deprecating at all. It's, I think he wants to be a leading man or something, but it's not, he's not that either. Um, he's constantly mugging, exaggerating, and sometimes looking at the camera and mugging, but he's crossing his eyes, he's making funny faces and funny voices. And it just comes off after a while, it's just desperate and just totally seeking attention. And I don't think it works. Now, compare that to some other comedy writer-directors. Albert Brooks, who I did an episode on him. I think he's a comedy genius. Um, Woody Allen, for all his personal flaws, talking about his films. Um, Chaplin, Keaton, um, Jerry Lewis, uh, Elaine May. All those people have really good, strong comic personas in their films. They're flawed people. Sometimes they're kind of smart um, and they're insecure, but they have a persona. And you know what else is, for the most part, other directors have used them in their films because they know their uh, screen persona is so fleshed out and so good. But I can't recall any other director putting Mel Brooks in one of their films because his, I don't understand what his comic persona on screen is supposed to be. And speaking again of the humor, a lot of it in his films is dated, um, aside from all the uh, inappropriate remarks and stuff like I mentioned earlier. But take a film like Blazing Saddles, where in the frontier town you see a sign in one of the stores that says, Howard Johnson's, it's an ice cream store, one flavor. So most people nowadays, younger people, they don't know what Howard Johnson's is. They don't know what one flavor, why that's funny. Because the ice cream store that used to be called 31 Flavors, I don't think they even call it that anymore. I think it's just called Baskin Robbins now. So that's, that's kind of weird. He also has a thing at the end of History of the World Part 1, like these fake coming attractions. And one of them will be uh, Hitler on Ice. 
and it's this guy dressed like, like Hitler ice skating around a skating rink. It's like, really? I, again with the Hitler jokes? Come on, guy. Can you think of something else here, please? It's not that funny anymore. You did it once. Um, very important thing about some of his films is the timing. Now, comic timing is everything, right? His timing is off in a lot of this stuff. There's these long pauses or it's just, there's something about it. Just, it's not working like they're waiting for a, for a laugh or they're waiting for applause. Don't wait for a laugh. Just keep on going. And if the audience doesn't hear the next line, they'll come back and see your film again. Let me give you an example. In the film Spaceballs, another film I don't think is very funny. We have a, a, a princess who's a druid. So the Bill Pullman character at one point says, just what I need on my ship, a Druish princess. Okay, kind of funny, I guess. And then John Candy, his buddy, looks at the camera and says, that's funny, she doesn't look Druish. And then pauses. It's like, I don't know what he's waiting for. Is he waiting for me to laugh? Is this supposed to be a TV show or is this a sketch? I don't know what it is. It's just very odd and, and off, something off about it. Uh, he also uses a lot of swear words in his films, I've noticed. And I think back then, 70s, 80s, that was kind of for a shock effect, like a quick laugh. But now you hear everything, so it's not that shocking anymore. Um, and I, going back to the characters, most of the characters in this film are very flat, uh, one-dimensional characters. The, the, the comedy is not character-driven like in some of those films I mentioned, like A New Leaf by Elaine May, or any of the Albert Brooks films, or any of the Woody Allen films. Those are character-driven films. These are not, they're just sticky, one note, you know, silly kind of characters. And again, the jokes often revolve around uh, bodily functions, or anatomy jokes, or sex jokes, so. There's my rant about Mel Brooks. Now this is the Mel Brooks collection. There's nine of his films in here. The producers is not in here for some reason. And um, you know, it's, I got this uh, pretty cheap at one point. I think it was like 20 or 30 bucks. And I looked on Amazon yesterday. It's going for 170 bucks. So I assume it's out of print, but it has like, the 12 chairs. And see if I, yeah, can, you can see this. It has Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein. Um, silent movie, high anxiety. Uh, what is that? History of the World Part One, to be or not to be. That, the original is great with Jack Benny. I don't know why he thought he should remake this. There's a lot of ego involved in that, and he's the leading man in it. I don't think so. Spaceballs, Robin Hood Men in Tights. I've seen that once. It's pretty bad. So you know you can see all those films if you want to. Um, they're all, I think most, if not all of them are, are available for purchase. Um, some of them I see streaming. Um, I, I, would, I would guess that most of them are available through your local library. So there's my Mel Brooks is not funny rant. Feel free to disagree with me. Uh, leave a comment or a suggestion down here. Uh, leave a thumbs up. Don't leave a thumbs down. Subscribe would be great. Share this with your friends and neighbors. Otherwise, thanks for watching. See you next time.